welcome back to Dr. Deep State. And um, I'm not digging back into the 19th century as an empty academic exercise. These characters that we're talking about, Malthus, Darwin, Sumner, Galton, are going to tell us what is going on today and what's about to happen. So stay with me. I've created this uh, concept of esoteric biopolitics to highlight um, the animation underneath the events going on today. But let's just get into this. Um, from where we left off, I'm going to suggest that when we take Darwin, combine him with the thoughts and attitudes of Sumner, together we get this idea of social Darwinism. And we've heard about this term before. It's sort of the impulse behind a lot of the late 19th and early 20th century empire building with its eugenics program underneath it, usually Anglo-American in character. But what I'm going to suggest here is that we need to kind of take a step back and see beneath uh, the veneer of these programs in eugenics that were going on around the world in the late 19th and 20th century. But in short, uh, social Darwinism is going to be this idea that we're going to take the biological uh, concepts embedded in Darwin, and Foucault is going to hint on this too when he says this is the birth of real modern biopolitics. But underneath this idea of natural selection, survival of the fittest, we're going to begin to apply that to public policy. The elites, if you like, the oligarchical class of the late 19th century and today um, are going to use this policy and begin rolling it out in the 21st century. And in short, we want to see the movement of policy, though, so that the strong, the rich get richer, and the poor are marginalized and, in effect, um, eliminated from the scene altogether. And this is very biological in nature, what today we would call, you know, uh, DNA or people's code is the language of today. Now, on this face, we have to bear in mind that the eugenics movement was international. It hit every corner of the world, and it had a similar feature. In Japan, it was about creating a master race to administer um, so that the master race would administer over other Asian people. It had a certain face in South America and Germany. It was an Aryan face. Anglo-Americans had their face. So it stretched and you know, extended itself to whatever context or region um, it flourished in, but it was coordinated at the center. And I'm going to suggest to you that these were the various sort of guardians of the policy, but the true, uh, as Galton Darwin would say, wild men that were behind the scenes um, are um, being made manifest today. And that's where we've been building to this whole you know, this whole time. And that's when we get in the esoteric or messianic part of this long-term program. So what's the public face on the social Darwinism, this eugenics program? I think nobody better exemplifies this than Margaret Sanger. And I just want to get into a few of her uh, quotes because it gives you an idea of the um, not only the eugenics program of the late 19th and early 20th century, but the depopulation program that's about to fall upon us um, soon. So eugenics is going to come under the policy label of planned parenthood. Um, for Sanger, uh, she believed that, like William Graham Sumner, that the worst thing you want to do is uh, support uh, the needy above us because you're just kind of like enabling their bad habits. So like William Graham Sumner would say, a drunkard in the gutter is exactly where he belongs. So it's put that into public policy. Sanger's going to do that for us. And again, she's not just some person that she is the face, the PR face of the international oligarchical movement. This again, we're not doing accidental history here. So uh, she believed that society's tolerance and again, Malthus was the same way. What do we do? You know, this is Malthusian. This is, they're all interconnected through families and through uh, policy approaches, whatever region of the world it exists in. The Japanese would use the same kind of language, uh, the upper class in South America and so forth. So you shouldn't, a uh, society need not tolerate the morons, the human weeds, the feeble-minded, 
that's, we got to encourage dysgenics. It's not just that the best of us need to breed, but we have to really um, shut out that class of people. Um, so she was unabashed about these draconian policies. And these were implemented, as we know, in many of the U.S. states and parts of Europe and so forth. Um, but quote here, the, emerging, the emergency problem of segregation and sterilization must be faced immediately. Every feeble-minded girl or woman of the hereditary type, that type, especially of the moron class, should be segregated during the reproductive years. We prefer the policy of immediate sterilization, so ideally immediately sterilize the feeble-minded, the moronic class, as she's going to define them, of making sure that parenthood is absolutely prohibited. And this would be immediate because if you did this with an entire class of people, you wouldn't have to continue doing it, hopefully, over generations and generations. You'd nip it in the bud, is what her idea is. Now, this is from <clears throat> the Birth Control Review. She wrote it, so public record to apply a stern and rigid policy of sterilization and segregation to that grade of the population whose progeny is already tainted. Okay, new methods of science to identify these people. So we're going to appropriate farmlands and homesteads, you know, sort of like Malta said, you know, in the cities, put them in crowded and packed ways so they can disease each other out of existence in the countryside, find, you know, marshes that would pollute them, you know, out of existence. So for her, find the farmland that would isolate them and they would be taught to work under competent instructors, sort of a guardian class will get, will control guardian class to control these people for a period of their entire lives. So isn't that Sweet. She thinks that they should be sterilized and then afterwards made to work for the state. Very platonic. Quote, the danger to the community of the unsegregated, feeble-minded woman is more evident. The more dangerous. So it's easy to see the hardcore morons out there, but the more dangerous are the middle and high grades of these morons. Because despite the fact that their defect is not easily recognizable, they should nevertheless be prevented from procreation. And was there a strong pushback internationally or domestically about her rhetoric? No. Uh, it was slowly being rolled out into public policy. So in her view, these people that might pass as normal were the biggest threat. We have to get to them first, sterilize them, put them on the work farms for their entire lives. In my view, we should act without delay. So here's the important part. And again, these policies are about to be resurrected, I will argue. So who did she feel were the human weeds, the morons, the feeble-minded? Nearly, she said, 47.3, very statistical, it wasn't 47.6 or 51.2, 47.3% of the human population had the mentality of a 12 year old. And that's interesting because a moron, t- the definition of in the dictionary is a 17 year old. So she thought that half the population um, needed to be sterilized and be working for the state. No pushback at the time of these policies. Okay. Now, how is she regarded today? Well, as we're going to see in a moment, she's regarded as something of a celebrity by the, um, the face of the oligarchical class who sometimes are referred to as elites. Um, Here we see her saying the most successful educational approach to the Negro uh, would be through religious appeal because you can't really, uh, she she probably suspects, you know, hit them intellectually or some other way. So find their religious leaders and have their religious leaders uh, straighten them out. Tell them, you know, don't be procreating and you keep them under control. So that was her uh, plan there. So what are we getting to? What are we building toward here when we got the idea of eugenics? You know, plus Darwin, is he going to equal this social Darwin, these policies that are part of an international eugenics movement? They're very draconian like this. Um, We have to look at the esoteric part of this and dig into that and see where this has been and where it's going. 
But the goal here, we're going to argue, is to create a super race, super class of apotheosis. So part of the idea we're going to be seeing um, is this massive separation between uh, the one class and the other. Um, who are the faces of this? This isn't the real power. These are the guardian class. These people themselves are control. We're going to get to the wild men. We're building to that, that the, the real power that doesn't show its face. But we know in the late 19th century, the huge supporters of these policies were the robber barons <clears throat> um, and that oligarchical class, especially we see the Anglo-American piece of that. But the Rothschilds, the Rockefellers, uh, the Carnegies, and all of their foundations would promote this molecular research to you know, find the retards and and isolate them and sterilize them. Um, they would, you know, spend all their money, as Lily Kay would say, you know, trying to decode um, the germ of life from molecular research. And the Morgans, the DuPonts, the Pullmans, the Mellons, this whole entire class with their foundations usually dedicated to um, these days surreptitiously forwarding this agenda. And these policies were particularly large in the uh, Anglo-American empire and in Germany. And we will see later that the sponsors of these policies were the same people that sponsored generally from the, the banking class that would sponsor the, the rise of the Soviet power, the rise of the German power, the connections to wall street, um, so let's get to this. Why do, you know, like all these other policies of the 20th century that we've talked about when we talked about the deep state, whether we call something right or left, it's an illusion. Statistically, there's no difference in fundamental policies between uh, industrialization and deindustrialization, immigration, education policies, these people that, these policies that really, um, are deciding who we are as people and where we're going. And eugenics is just another policy. So from the right or the big time Christian right, we get this so-called uh, George Bush Sr. Um, if you want to see a fantastic book on this, I recommend Webster Tarpley's unofficial biography. It's of, of George Bush Sr., uh, 1991, I believe it's available on PDF. You can look into a skull and bones piece and how that organization um, um, was the formative uh, part of his life that you know sent him on a career into eugenics and his fascination with eugenics. But for example, right here, we get a quote from George Bush Sr. Uh, Although Planned Parenthood was forced during the fascist era and immediately thereafter to tone down Sanger's racist rhetoric from race betterment to family planning, so repackaging, and we can go into um, how that was, you know, done by the uh, the leader of the uh, eugenics international movement, Osborne, and so forth. How he would find the right term, social biology or biological ethics, uh, genetic engineering. It would be repackaged generally as social biology um, in the 1960s and 70s. So he's saying, you know, so uh, we tweaked it a little bit, family planning instead of racial betterment, took the racial component out of it a little bit for the benefit of the poor and racial minorities. The organization's basic goal of curbing the population rate among undesirables, that's pretty similar to her language, never really changed. Bush publicly asserted that he agreed 1,000%. So we get that from this uh, manufactured right wing, if you're still you know hanging on to these ideologies then I guess this is probably going past you. So that's the dialectic. As long as you're believing in one side more than the other, you're inside the dialectic. You're just moving the oligarchical's agenda historically, not until you stand out. But this is part of what we're doing. We talk about uh, esoteric biopolitics of the new world order. Um, we're doing instruction, compliance, and resistance. Some of us may choose to comply, others may resist, and we'll get to how we do that. Um, so what else do we have here from Sanger? We don't want the world to go, we don't want the world to, we don't want the word to go out that we want to exterminate the Negro population. That's Margaret Sanger. So hush, hush, even back in her day, hush, hush, we're trying to eliminate a population 
of people. And we see, just like George Bush on the other side, Hillary Clinton, I admire Margaret Sanger enormously. I am really in, in awe of her. So why are these contemporaries able to say things and get away with it? Well, the oligarchs control the education, the media, and the dialectic. And so um, if you call them on it, because if it doesn't fit into your preconceived ideas, you just kind of let it go. So eugenics was rebranded. 